Today we're at United States Naval Test Pilot School to learn all about helicopters. In the 1400s, Leonardo da Vinci sketched the aerial screw and the idea of spinning wings was around long before that. Today's drones, auto gyros, and helicopters are descendants of these early designs. This is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty. And today we're at United States Naval Test Pilot School at Naval Air Station Patuxent River. Here they train experienced pilots from all branches of the military on how to be test pilots. During this year-long course, they spend 500 hours in the classroom and an additional 100 hours in the air piloting different aircraft, learning how to isolate variables and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. During their time at test pilot school, students fly fixed wing aircraft like airplanes, gliders, and jets. They also fly helicopters. These are a type of rotorcraft, which is a vehicle that has a rotating wing. And the history of rotorcraft go a long way back. Vertical flight has long inspired inventors and engineers alike. In the late 1400s, Leonardo da Vinci conceived of and sketched an aerial screw, but it was Jules Verne who popularized the term helicopter. In 1886, Verne published Robert the Conqueror, a novel in which the main character built an aircraft that flew with rotors, very similar to today's helicopters. You may have seen falling maple seeds that look like rotors as they spin towards the ground, and the Wright brothers were inspired by a toy that had spinning wings. The development of helicopters, however, unlike the invention of the airplane, happened across continents with different people solving different parts of the problem at different times and achieving varying degrees of success. In 1923, Spanish engineer Juan de la Sierra introduced the first successful rotocraft, which he called the autogyro, a type of gyroplane. The gyroplane differs from the helicopter in that the rotor is not powered so it doesn't have to deal with torque, the tendency of the aircraft to turn in the opposite direction of the rotor. Instead of the rotor pulling the aircraft forward like on a helicopter, the gyroplane had a propeller to keep it moving. This also meant that it couldn't hover like a helicopter, but it could fly more slowly than airplanes. De La Sierva's autogyro was the predecessor of the modern helicopter. On December 19, 1930, Amelia Earhart made a test flight in the autogyro to become the first female autogyro pilot in the world. In the United States, Russian-born engineer Igor Sikorsky turned to helicopters in 1938 after his flying boat business dried up. His successful experiments during the early years of World War II earned him military production contracts that led to the establishment of the helicopter industry. Sikorsky's test vehicle had many of the same features as modern helicopters. A single main rotor with cyclic and collective pitch, as well as a tail rotor to counter torque. Since its introduction, many private companies have developed and continue to develop new technologies used to advance helicopter design and usage. To help learn more about helicopters, Marty and I are flying in a Lakota with pilots from U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. We want to share this experience with you because it's pretty awesome. You'll notice that Beth and I are on different flights with different pilots, but that gives you a front row seat of what's happening here in the cockpit. Part of flying in a helicopter means that you're going to be interrupted by radio chatter. That's just part of flying. But the cool part is... 270 right, contact ground. ...to be in the area via our bashers... Sure, ...planning to uh, burn EDs... ...EDs shell the north... ...safety hazard. As in case. The Wright brothers are known for having invented the first airplane. But did you know they got their start in aviation with a toy that looks a lot like a helicopter? Hi, my name is Keith York. And I'm the great-great-grandnephew of Wilbur and Orville Wright, the brothers who invented the airplane. One of the fun things about the Wright brothers' interest in flight is that it was inspired at a young age 
when their father brought home a toy that looks a lot like a helicopter. This is the Wright Bat. This plastic toy is very similar to the ones that the Wright brothers played with at a young age. I'm gonna put this together and then we'll see how it works. So I found with the sail port on step one, it can be really tricky to get the rod to slide in. So I'm gonna try to pry these two little bits of plastic apart with a toothpick. There we go. And we'll see if that helps. You know what? I might be putting this in the wrong side. Science is always a little bit about trial and error. As I can tell from my picture, it needs to go all the way through. I think my toothpick idea was the right way to go. One of these seals is larger and one is smaller. So the smaller one is the one we're gonna use for the cross arm. Yeah, there we go, look at that. We have both our lower half sails installed. We're gonna slide the propeller and bottom brackets onto our assembly. So this is our propeller bracket. We'll slide onto the top. The bottom bracket will slide onto the bottom. Now these hooks need to be towards the inside, I can tell. A little wiggle. There we go. Taking a little bit of effort on these, but that's all right. Put the rubber band through and attach to each hook. Now we're gonna, on these rods, we've got a square end and a round end. Square end is going into the center support. I'm gonna use my toothpick again to kind of loosen up the groove. One down, one to go. Okay. Yeah, toothpick method I think is very helpful. I've used the toothpick to kind of give myself enough space and now that I've got it in there, and just slide it all the rest of the way through. Not so bad, huh? All right, now let's take a look at this. We have a propeller on the top and a rubber band in the middle. When I spin the propeller like this, energy is being stored in the rubber band so that eventually, when I let go, the propeller is gonna spin in the opposite direction and our little toy will fly. Let's give it a try. Now, the Wright brothers didn't pursue vertical flight, but the bat toy was mentioned in a letter that Wilbur wrote to the Smithsonian asking for any information that they had on aeronautical research. The Wright bat is obviously my favorite helicopter-like toy, but there's plenty of others that you can try out at home. These are simple toys where you can provide the thrust by spinning your hands around a stick with a propeller on the top. Look at how far it goes. What happens if you spin it the other way? What does that tell you? You can also buy small propellers that pop on the top of a popsicle stick to make a simplified version of the right bat. There are simple drones that work similarly to the right bat, but with a battery and a motor that provides the power rather than a rubber band. What do you think the Wright brothers would have thought of this toy? Maybe playing with a toy like this will inspire the future aviation innovators or inventors. You look pretty busy flying this helicopter. Can you tell us what's going on? Uh, we divide everything into aviate, navigate, and communicate. So my aviating tasks are just keeping the helicopter in the upright position, which is relatively easy to do in this helicopter. There's a lot of computers in the background uh, that are working to keep uh, the aircraft stable. Um, I'm also maintaining altitude, I'm maintaining heading, I'm remaining within the area, and I'm uh, using the landmarks around me in order to uh, navigate around. The navigating part is effectively that, it's maintaining with the route of where I want to go. What's the most the difficult part of flying a helicopter? Um, I think it's the initial learning how to do it, uh, using both your hands and your feet because you control all three axes. Uh, you can obviously turn with the pedals when you're in a hover. Uh, you can turn on a spot. Like an airplane, you, the stick controls the same uh, motion, so laterally you're going to get roll and longitudinally you'll get pitch, but then for low speed flight in a helicopter, collective isn't just power, it is the vertical axis, so you're, you control all three axes. You start at hover, you have to get off the deck um, and learn how to hover, so I think that was like the hardest part initially, but 
I think eventually at some point it clicks for everybody. As you can see, flying a helicopter isn't easy. Let's learn more about how they fly. Okay, so the, there's a total of uh, four flight controls the pilot has to worry about. The first is the tail rotor pedals, which are operated by both feet. And this is how we turn the aircraft into hover. So if you move full right pedal, you look at the uh, tail rotor, it just adjusts the uh, pitch of the blades. Full left pedal. And then once we're in forward flight, the pedals basically become neutral because the tail rotor at that point is on for the ride. The second control is called the collective, it's a stick on the left hand side. We're lifting up on the stick. It adds equal pitch to each rotor blade, which then picks the aircraft up into a hover. And then if you push the stick down, the aircraft comes back down. So this is the up and down control. Next control, third control, is called a cyclic stick, which sits in between your legs. It's controlled with the right hand, and this is basically your direction and speed control. So by moving the control left and right, it's left and right turns. If you want to fly the aircraft forward, you push it forward. If you want to fly the aircraft backward, you pull it backward. So this is your direction control, it's also your speed control. So the further you push this forward, the faster the aircraft goes. The final control is the throttle, which is controlled by the uh, left hand grip. It's like a motorcycle grip, you just twist it, and that controls the engine speed. And those are the flight controls. Why does TPS have helicopters? For the military, uh, we satisfy a variety of different mission sets that helicopters um, are really the only ones that are able to do it. Not only do we operate on aircraft carriers, we also operate on destroyers, cruisers, and a variety of other ships that aren't suitable for fixed wing traffic. Yeah, so the hover capability out okay. in the maritime environment, i.e. open ocean, um, is very critical um, as it allows us to access ships and other resources such as uh, landing zones um, that would otherwise unable to be accessed via fixed wing aircraft. Helicopters serve a very important niche area of aviation. Helicopters can do a lot of the things that airplanes can do. However, they don't typically have the range, and they don't have the speed that airplanes are able to achieve. Backyard, While airplanes are able to fly fast, they need an improved surface or runway area in order to be able to land and depart. The military has a lot of uses for helicopters. Some of them you may have never considered. While helicopters became more advanced, so did their uses. Today, helicopters are used for everything from sightseeing to search and rescue. They are invaluable tools on the battlefield for transporting troops and supplies into areas where there are no places for fixed wing aircraft to land. They were important to MASH units, Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals, during the Korean War for transporting the wounded. And today, medevac helicopters are still used to quickly transport critical patients. Just like the Wright brothers were entertained by a toy with spinning wings, today drones are a popular toy. Everything from simple rotors that go up and down to much more advanced drones that race through complex courses. Students can even code their own drones to fly in formation, match up to music, and do stunts. Helicopters are so versatile that NASA even sent one to Mars. The Mars Ingenuity helicopter was built to survive the harsh environment of Mars. It weighs in at less than 4 pounds on Earth, but only 1.5 pounds on Mars. It has to produce enough lift to fly in the Martian atmosphere, which is less than 1% the density of Earth. To do this, its rotors are almost 4 feet long. It has flown over 30 separate flights, with its longest flight over 2,000 feet, and has reached an altitude of 39 feet. While this mission was a demonstration, this technology may one day help future human exploration of Mars. Let's learn a little bit more about the connection between a rotor blade and an airplane wing. Hi there, I'm John Trichler. I'm the Chief of Academics at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. And my background is that I was an Army helicopter pilot uh, and then went to school to learn more about helicopters and aerodynamics. And I became a teacher of helicopter aerodynamics. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the way the air moves around the rotating wings of the helicopter. What I'll do is I'll, I'll draw here a picture of something called an airfoil. Right? And so if you were to take a slice through a wing or through a helicopter's rotor blade, it would have this shape. Now, as that airplane 
uh, goes through the air, right? Uh, the air moves around the wing, right? And as that air is moving around the wing, it generates forces, right? Uh, there are forces called lift and drag. And the lift force is really related to the pressure on the wing. And the drag force is really related to the way that the friction, uh, that's, uh, that's the force of two things rubbing together. And so the wing actually rubs up against the air uh, as, it's going, uh, as it's going along. And so if we were just to look at the airfoil only, the lift force is mostly up and down and the drag force is mostly in line with the flow of the air. When an airplane is moving along normally, it has uh, thrust. Thrust is generated by the motor of the airplane, by the engine, right? And that keeps it moving forward, right? And, uh, and so the forces that are acting on that airplane are thrust, lift, and then we have drag against the air, and we have the weight of the airplane as well. All right, so it turns out that helicopters also have wings, right? But they're a little bit different than the way wings are set up on an airplane. You know, the wing of the helicopter is long and skinny, and it rotates like this. And so what we'll do is look right down the edge of that, what we call a rotor blade, and see that it also has the same sort of airfoil section uh, as, as an airplane wing. That's a quick introduction to how helicopters work and how the, the motion of those rotary wings through the air generate forces that cause the helicopter to go. I love learning about helicopters. Here's my crew. And this is something you can try at home. To make a paper helicopter, or whirly gig, you'll need just a few simple supplies. A pair of scissors, a piece of paper, a ruler, and some tape. You will need a piece of paper two inches wide and five and a half inches long. You can get a piece of paper this size by either measuring or folding a normal sheet of printer paper in half several times. Once you have the right size paper, fold it in half and mark this line with a pencil. On one side, mark the center and make a cut that divides that side in half. These will be your rotors. On the other side of the paper, measure in three-fourths of an inch. Cut along the center line. Be sure not to cut too far. Fold these sides in towards the center of the bottom half. This will be the body of your whirly gig. Now the fun starts. Drop the whirly gig with the rotors at the top and watch it spin to the ground. Think about what modifications you can make to get it to spin more or stay in the air longer. The National Air and Space Museum has an amazing collection of helicopters. Imported from the UK in 1928, this gyroplane helped Harold Pickerin adapt the autogyro for the American market. In 1935, Pickerin's Autogyro Company of America, AC-35, was prototyped as a two-seater flying car, but the price tag was too rich for the average American, so it never got off the ground. This was the first helicopter to go into production, and in 1942, its tests convinced the military that helicopters could be useful. In 1946, the Bell 47B became the first helicopter certified for commercial operations. Various types of this model were produced through 1975, making it one of the most successful helicopters of all time. In fact, it was another Bell helicopter that first flew a U.S. president. In 1957, it transported President Eisenhower from the White House to Camp David. The Secret Service chose it because of its safety and reliability, but it was too small and too slow. 
So, presidents started flying much larger helicopters soon after. One of the most iconic helicopters in our collection is the Huey Smokey 3. The Huey is well known for its starring roles in popular movies like Platoon and Predator. It is one of the most successful military helicopters of all time and changed how the U.S. Army fought wars. It became a symbol of the Vietnam War, where it delivered troops and supplies, as well as laying down smoke screens to protect friendly forces like Smokey 3 did. The most effective air-sea rescue helicopter of its time was the U.S. Coast Guard's Sikorsky's HH-52. It was the first turbine-powered helicopter and the first that could land in water without using awkward floats making it ideal for water rescues. The Coast Guard operated 99 of these helicopters between 1962 and 1989, saving approximately 15,000 lives. Jennifer Murray flew this helicopter around the world, twice, and set a number of records, including the first piston-powered helicopter to make such a journey, and the first such flight made by a woman. The Robinson is one of the most successful civil helicopters today. These are only a few of the awesome rotorcraft in our collection. If you want to see more, check out our website or come visit us. Helicopters are amazing pieces of machinery that have their origins all the way back to Leonardo da Vinci, and even before that. They are capable of doing things that other aircraft are not. We'd like to thank the United States Naval Test Pilot School for having us out. Seeing the work they do close up illustrates how dedicated they are to their mission to train the next generation of test pilots. Okay, now let's take a look at this. We have a propeller at the top and a rubber band. Don't put it in front of your face. A rubber band in the middle. When I spin the propeller like this, energy is being stored in the rubber band. Oh no, all right, we gotta hook it back up. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We have a propeller on the top and a rubber band in the middle. And when I spin the propeller like this, I need to keep looking at the camera. Right, now let's take a look at this. We have a propeller on the top and a rubber band in the middle. When I spin the propeller like this, energy is being stored in the rubber band. So that eventually, once I let go, the propeller will spool. Well, as long as the rubber band stays, <laughs>